Hi, my name is Ray Gardaki. I'm an Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Neurosurgery at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I'm here today to talk to you about the basic approach to the lumbar spine. So this is going to be the basic transforaminal approach to the lumbar spine. This is for a posterolateral contained herniation or an extrusion that is not migrated, and it can also be used for a purely intraforaminal herniation above the pedicle. First thing you want to do is get an orthogonal view of your intended disc space on both the AP and lateral view, which we've done on x-ray. And then the next thing you want to do is draw lines identifying the center of the disc on both of those views. So there's the center of our L4-5 disc. There's our midline. I like to mark the medial pedicular line on these. This gives me an idea of how deep into the spinal canal I am. So there's a line to the center of the disc to the very anterior annulus. That depth from the midline marks our approach. So this line that marks from the caudal end of the contralateral pedicle to the top of the ipsilateral pedicle is a good rule of thumb to determine your best trajectory for the contained herniation or one that's localized in the lateral recess. This allows you to avoid the exiting nerve root and dorsal root ganglion and get more medial on your approach to the lateral recess, yet still have good access to the disc to at least the midline. This distance drawn up to that trajectory is where you're gonna insert the needle. So now our lines are marked. I'm going to insert at our insertion point down about a 30 degree angle towards the foramen. And it looks like I'm docked on the lateral facet. So we'll check a lateral view now. So we can see that we're dorsal. So I'm gonna back my needle up, go more ventral and advance. And you see I'm just at the ventral portion of the superior reticular process. So now we're gonna check it back to AP and we're gonna see how medial we are. So you see that cranial caudal trajectory we chose puts us closer to the pars, which allows us to enter the canal more medially and not be pushed out by the lateral aspect of the superior articular process. We're gonna go a little bit more inferior and advance, and that's a good spot. We're just about the medial pedicular line at the top of the disc space. So now we'll make our incision. So here, if you pull on the needle in the skin, you can get a little gap between the needle and the skin and if you cut away from the needle, you'll be able to make one clean cut on either side of the needle in Langer's lines. And again, we do them in Langer's lines because there's less tension on the wound and it heals up very nicely. Sometimes you can't even find these scars a year after surgery. Now that the needle's in the right place, we take out our stylet, insert our guide wire, maintain the guide wire while we remove the needle. Now that we've confirmed that the Guide wire is in the right location. We'll dilate over the guide wire. These sequential dilators allow you to pass through the fascia and paraspinous muscles and feel the facet. Helps to rotate these as you advance them. We see that the first dilator st st stood off from the end of the guide wire. This suggests that we're hanging a little bit on the facet joint. I'm gonna try to give a little bit of downward pressure and rotate and I could feel myself drop into the foramen and we see we're right at the medial particular line. So basically what that's done is created a opening in the transverse process facet capsule confluence and pushed into the foramen. Now we're gonna go with the next size dilator. And as we work our way up, it's possible that one of these hangs on the facet and we can't pass ventral. So again, we see that one's hanging a little bit. I'm gonna rotate and put a little downward pressure and it pushed in pretty easily and we're still able to advance it to the medial pedicular line. So we're still good in terms of our access to the foramen. Here's the final dilator. Again, I can tell that I'm not sat down all the way. I'm gonna push and rotate, and I feel myself drop in. And you can see we're pretty much in the same place. So we're gonna insert the cannula now over the dilator and advance it into the foramen. And we can see that sits down fairly well into the foramen. So now we're gonna introduce the endoscope. So I like to place the water flow for the endoscope on the right side because I like to hold the scope with my left hand. So we're gonna turn the water on and introduce the scope into the cannula. All right, so we've introduced the endoscope. On this one, I can feel bone dorsally. So as I go dorsally, I can feel bone here. That's my superior articular process. So this is some facet capsule and inner transverse ligament that we punctured through with the dilator set. This is epidural fat in the foramen. 
our disc is going to be right here. I'm going to move caudally here to feel for bone because that's going to be our pedicle. What we have here is to our left where my open jaw is, is the pedicle. At the top of the screen is the superior articular process. So this is our arch and this is our disc space. You see how I'm touching the disc right here on the x-ray. So this squishy thing is the annulus right there. This is the end plate above. This is the end plate below. So you can see it looks very similar through the scope, but you can, you can palpate with the tip of your instrument and see that you're on bone, you're on bone, and you have the squishy disc. So the way to identify it at, your, at the floor of the canal is you can insert your, your electrocautery device caudal to the disc. So what you see on the x-ray is that the tip of the cautery is exiting the disc space. It went past the end plate, which means that you're on the floor of the canal. And it's also medial to the medial wall of the pedicle. So that's the medial wall of the pedicle that the tip of the cautery is on. And it's outside the disc, which means you're on the floor of the canal. If you were inside the disc inadvertently, as you extend this out, it would deflect off the end plate. And then that would tell you that you're not in the spinal canal. You'd have to find that proper plane. So if there were a disc herniation here, basically what you would see is a giant mound of disc material right here. You can see the epidural fat right here and the traversing nerve is going to be just deep to or possibly even dorsal to that. So I'm gonna insert this kerosene and see if I can't hook it on the medial aspect of the SAP. So what you can actually see is the, the medial edge of that kerosene is at the medial edge of the superior articular process at the medial particular line. So if you had to open up the lateral recess, you can through the foramen by resecting some of the superior articular process, the ventral surface of the superior articular process, which is extra articular, and resecting it dorsally, you can raise the roof of that lateral recess and give the traversing root a little bit more room. This can be done with reamers to start with, which allows you to medialize your scope and is useful for a more centralized disc herniation. For a posterior lateral herniation, this would be a, a fine approach. You can also use a high-speed burr to open this up much quicker and very safely since it's done under direct visualization. This is the floor of the canal at L5. This is the floor of the canal at L4. And you see there is a bit of a disc protrusion here because this is the top of the disc here. So now we're gonna use the biter to cut the fibers of the annulus here. You can see you can kind of push it in and cut some of the fibers. And this will allow access to the subannular space. The loose fragments of annulus can be bipolar and you'll see these kind of loose bits of seaweed will shrink right down if you hit them with the bipolar to give you a nice space to work. And you can see this is intradiscal here. So now here we're actually going into the disc and grabbing some disc material, some subangular material. This isn't a true disc herniation, but it is a bulging degenerative disc. So there is some material in the subangular space. We can see we're basically to midline. So we, you can get quite far ventral to the dura. So really the way to think about a transferamal approach to the lumbar spine is an approach that goes through the foramen and is ventral to the dura. So in this situation, if you're doing a transferamal approach and have a posterior lateral herniation, you would continue to remove disc material until you see the traversing root drop down into the field of view onto the floor of the spinal canal. And we've already defined the floor of the spinal canal with our uh, cautery device. So you can see we're getting some disc material out here. There actually is a little bit of a disc bulge here. It's not a focal herniation, but more of a broad-based protrusion. We can go medial to the pedicle, this defines the floor of our canal here at L5. We can go cranially, and that defines the floor of the canal at L4. And what we want 
is for those two lines to be on the same plane without anything obstructing between it. So you can see as I reach upward, there's a little bit of epidural fat, which means our traversing nerve root is right on the other side of that fat. So now you can see the fat is starting to float a little bit. When I pulsate the inflow, so it's, it's slowly decompressing. This is starting to move around. And ultimately what you'd like to see is actually the nerve on the floor of the canal. Sometimes there's some epidural fats in front of it. So between inspection, palpation, and just looking at it, you need to determine whether it's worthwhile to dissect off the fat to clearly see the root, or whether you have a good enough feel palpating that this is open. And you can see here, I can go from the back of the four body to the back of the five body with no obstruction. And you'll see I'm all the way to the midline. So I know that this spot right now is decompressed from the foramen to the midline. That's actually the PLL medially that you can see the lateral bands of right there. And that's your transforamal approach. At this point, you remove the scope, remove the cannula, typically do one ovicral stitch in the subcutaneous skin and a dermabond. The patients can shower the day of surgery and they go home without narcotics.